Hello, I'm Lisa Frost, a spiritual director and a member at University United Methodist Church in Baton Rouge, coming to you from my kitchen um, with a few thoughts for our midweek devotional. It's it's good to um, good to be with you whenever you watch this and wherever you are. Gretchen Rubin is a favorite writer and podcaster of mine, and every week she sends an email out um, reporting five things that make her happier. If I were to do that this week, one of them would be Disciple Bible Study. Our new Disciple 2 group started meeting last week, um, the first time of 32 meetings, um, as we go through the books of Genesis and Exodus, um, and then Luke and Acts, um, with lots of other good things thrown in. In Isaiah, we're instructed to enlarge our gathering space. It reads, enlarge the space of your tent and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare, lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. Zoom allows us to enlarge our tent, bringing together people in our group from university and from First Grace in New Orleans and from Alexandria and Slidell. We even have two people from New York. The group listens well to each other and to scripture um, that they're reading and considering that week. If you haven't participated in a disciple study, I can't recommend it enough. It is a Bible study, but there's something special that happens in the reading discussion. I see time and time again a transformation happening in people. In reading and rereading many times um, these stories, I always find something new and surprising. I want to have a practice of daily Bible reading, and by facilitating or participating in this group, I do that. I'm afraid to say that otherwise that book gets a little dusty. I hope I'm not the only one that feels that way. In this group this year, we're beginning at the beginning, Genesis 1. In uh, Hebrew, Genesis means, translates, in the beginning. This is such a familiar story. We try to reread it um, together with a fresh eye and ear. One way to do this is to read it in different translations. And I just offer that as um, a clue for you as you um, are contemplating scripture. Here's a couple of translations from just the first uh, two verses in Genesis to listen to. See what catches your attention. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the earth, face of the deep while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. That's from the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version, which is mostly what we read um, in the United Methodist Church. That's kind of the standard translation for many studies. Um, and in the Common English Bible, God began to create, no, I'm sorry, when God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was without shape or form. It was dark over the deep sea and God's wind swept over the waters. And in the message, first this, God created the heavens and the earth, all you see and all you don't see. Earth was a soup of nothing nothingness, a bottomless emptiness, an inky blackness. God's spirit brooded like a bird over the watery abyss. Is there a word that catches your attention in any of these translations? Um, I love God's spirit brooded like a bird over the water. The words paint a picture for me, um, and that surprises me a little bit. The first chapter of Genesis continues day by day to guide us through the poetic retelling of the creation. From separating light and dark, the waters from the waters, making uh, land and sea, Making the lights of the sun and the moon, bringing forth animals of the sea and the land, and then on that sixth day, making people in God's own image. Here are these verses from the message about that sixth day. God spoke, let us make human beings in our image, make them reflecting our nature. So they can be responsible for the fish in the sea and the birds in the air, the cattle, and yes, earth itself, and every animal that moves on the face of the earth. God created human beings. He created them godlike, reflecting God's nature. He created them male and female. God blessed them, prosper, reproduce, fill earth, take charge, 
Be responsible for fish in the sea and birds in the air, for every living thing that moves on the face of the earth. Then God said, I've given you every sort of seed-bearing plant on earth and every kind of fruit-bearing tree given them all to you for food. To all animals and all birds, everything that moves and breathes, I give whatever grows out of the ground for food, and there it was. God looked over everything he had made. It was so good, so very good. I know there's a lot to talk about in that passage. Um, and, and our group did talk extensively about these ideas of being made in the image of God. Our commentary from our disciple manual also asked us to think about how we're interacting with a creation, our responsibility that's been on my mind this week. I, I hope it's on my mind all the time. I think the first step for me is what I would call the discipline of noticing. I find myself paying more attention to the trees in my neighborhood, uh, the wind, the early morning sky. I know this sounds so obvious, but often I go through the day with not noticing any of it. As I do this, as I use a practice of noticing my breath deepens and my body relaxes. When asked, many people tell me that they feel closest to God outside. So listen to this, a little bit of another favorite author of mine, John O'Donohue, um, that great Irish poet and writer, um, talking about praying in creation, remembering too that in that um, second chapter of Genesis, we get the the scripture um, that says this, God formed man out of the dirt from the ground and blew into his nostrils the breath of life. The man came alive, a living soul. So here's uh, a little bit about what O'Donohue writes about praying in creation. One of the lovely ways to pray is to take your body out into the landscape and be still in it. Your body is made of clay. So your body is actually a miniature landscape that has got up from under the earth is now walking on the normal landscape. Isn't that an interesting um, illusion? And he continues, if you go out for several hours into a place that is wild, your mind begins to slow down, down, down. What is happening is that the clay of your body is retrieving its own sense of sisterhood with the clay of the landscape, he continues. I also think that trees are incredible presences. There's incredible symmetry in a tree between its inner life and its outer life, between its rooted memory and external actual presence. A tree goes up and down at once and produces enough branches to incarnate wild divinity. So I think landscape is an incredible mystical teacher. And when you begin to tune into its sacred presence, something shifts in you. Mm. So try and take yourself outside today. Um, the sun has just peeped out while I'm recording this. I know we're gonna have a rainy week, at least in Baton Rouge this week. But find a time to feel the groundedness and the gratitude of of your own creation as part of God's great creation. Breathe there. Maybe have a little stillness. Also, you might want to ask yourself what action you can take to be responsible for creation. What practice might you take up in this new month of February um, to be kinder and um, more gentle to the earth? To close today, I just wanted you to hear a little bit more of what O'Donoghue, what O'Donoghue has to offer on creation. He writes, one of the lovely developments in consciousness is this dawning recognition that we are guests of the universe and that landscape was the firstborn of creation and was here hundreds of millions of years before us. It knows what is actually going on. To put it in a theological way, I feel that landscape is always at prayer and its prayer is seamless. Every stone, every tree, every field is a different place. When your eye begins to, be, to um, become attentive to this panorama of differentiation, 
and you realize what a privilege it is to actually be here. So I send you great blessings this week um, in your practice of noticing.